We open this service in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I have been lucky enough to be in Bolivia twice on November the 2nd, um, many years ago. But November the 2nd is Dia de los Muertos, or the Day of the Dead. Um, and it coincides with All Saints Day, or Todos Santos. And it's quite amazing. Um, I witnessed people gather together in family groups around the graves of their loved ones who have uh, previously died. And the graves would be decorated and elaborate with elaborate flowers and then um, spreads of food and drink would be put out for the rest of the day. The families would just celebrate that person's life and they would pray for them um, throughout the day. Um, friends and strangers were welcome uh, to join in with the prayers and often had their kindness repaid with food. And uh, I was certainly offered food and drink. There was plenty of drinking that was happening too. Um, it reminded me of the verse that we had recently um, when Jesus said to the Pharisees in Luke 28, verse 38, that he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. So today, uh, in this service and in the service at church, uh, we remember those who have passed on from life, this life, this veil of tears, to the real life with Jesus, the life that Jesus has gone to repair, prepare for all those who believe. So let us pray. Thank you, great God, that you have made yourself known to us. And thank you for the life that you give that will never end. Thank you for the privilege of serving you. Keep us from putting ourselves first. Make us humble and considerate so that, like your son, we can be of service to others. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who gives us that life. We know that through faith, we, along with all the saints who have gone before us, will be raised up on the last day to be with Jesus forever. Christ the 
For this special day, we have two gospel readings. The first is from Matthew 16, verses 21 to 27. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that is, he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. The next Gospel reading is from Matthew 14, verses 22 to 32. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, let me come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to you, O Christ. Hey, everybody. Pastor Kev here. Um... This week is uh, the last uh, session, if you will, of the sermon series. Uh, the Bible is not a self-help book. But what else we're doing this Sunday is we're, we're remembering and giving thanks for those who have died in the faith. And uh, not only this year, but those that we miss. But... What we give thanks for is their faith. They they held on, and not only that is they they know it firsthand right now. But that doesn't mean that they were free of difficulties and hardships, and uh, and those who would seek to steer them away from what true faith is, and that leads into what I want to share about. Um, today and it's um, something that's called pop psychology and uh, 
it's something that's creeping into the church and uh, focusing on self-help rather than preaching Jesus. And it's also deceiving the world. And I'll share a bit more about that. But how I want to begin is just use an illustration. An illustration from one of my favourite movies, Man from Snowy River. I don't know how many times I've watched this. It's one of my go-tos. Um, brilliant movie and based upon a poem that um, that A.B. Banjo Patterson wrote. Uh, and he's also um, uh, the author of Waltzing Matilda. Now, the story is that, um, well, bottom line, the poem is about uh, the ride of the man from Snowy River. But uh, where I want to go is uh, touch on something else in the story, and that's a relationship between two of the main characters, uh, Jim Craig, who's played by Tom Berlinson, and uh, Jessica Harrison, who's played by Sigmund Thornton. Now, they develop a love for each other. And, uh, well, Jessica's father finds out he's the um, um, cattle station owner and he's not very happy and he threatens to send Jessica away to a boarding school. And Jessica, well, she reacts by saddling a horse in the middle of the night and riding up into the mountains where Jim uh, lives. Well, he was working at the cattle station. That's how they met. Uh, anyway, uh, they she goes looking for Jim, and um, and while she's up there, this big big storm hits, and it throws her off a horse, and she ends up down a cliff. And as you can see in the image there, I've had to point out where Jessica is quite precarious and uh, she's in a lot of strife. Anyway, she cries out for help and uh, top of her lungs and eventually tries to climb out herself because she's incapable and uh, she's in a real pickle. Anyway, Jim eventually finds her and, uh, and when Jim looks down, what if he said these words? Don't worry, be happy. Well, Jessica would have looked up at him and what? Really? Um, wouldn't have helped her at all. But thankfully, Jim, he didn't say those words. He lowered his whip down and Jessica was able to grab hold and climb free. And Jessica, well, she couldn't save herself. She needed somebody to help her out. Now, What about you? Is your salvation, is that up to you? Or do you need a saviour? Joseph Matera, Matera he, he says, much of the culture has been captivated with a postmodern notion that truth cannot be known. We can only feel our way through life and this is pretty serious because you know what this is really drawing on is the subjective feelings of a person which can't alter reality even though some people think that can it's only objectivity the object reality that that well that we have to look to for change and pop psychology basically encourages this emotional approach to life and if you compare it you know um, the chart that you can see I won't read the green which is all about professional um, uh, psychology but look at pop psychology definition concept concepts believed to be based on psychology and considered cred credible by the public, by the public, even if, if not always scientifically validated. So it's public opinion again. So source of the information is mainstream media, self-help books, TV shows, radio programs, online content. The depth and complexity 
simplified concepts for broader appeal, which can lead to oversimplification or misinterpretation. And regulation and accountability, well, there is none. Lax strict regulation, creators or proponents not always held accountable for misinformation. And there are so many people online, TikTok, Instagram and elsewhere, and the books. There are so many books and they're bestsellers because people want this stuff. They want to be in control of their lives. You want to be in control of your life. But, you know, the bottom line of this pop psychology is don't worry, be happy. You know, which has got no substance at all. And even the Word of God is treated in the same way. It's used as a self-help book that people pick and choose verses out of context. And, you know, I was just at a pastor's um, prayer gathering and there was a quote from Scripture that was totally out of context that was applied to us. And all I can do is shake my head because these are pastors and there are so many pastors that are doing this. So how do you read the Bible? Is it all about you? Is it all about you? Or is it about your saviour, Jesus? You know, and when we study the word, you know, we need to research, we need to look at it in depth. You know, we can't just turn up and open the book and start saying, well, some Bible studies are led in such a way. What does this passage mean to you? What did you hear or what are you feeling, thinking? It's all about your subjective interpretation. It's not drawing on the objective. And you can make it say what you want. You know, the Bible speaks against this. It, well, first and foremost, it says, the elders who direct the affairs of the church, uh, church well are worthy of double honour, especially those who work, whose work is preaching and teaching, as you can see in 1 Timothy 5. But there's a warning from James 3.1. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. And that applies to me right here, right now. You know, if I'm if I'm not doing the right thing by you, I'm in strife. You know, so I, I want you to know the truth. You know, and Second Timothy chapter two. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth correctly handles the word of truth. Looking at context, letting scripture interpret scripture, treating it right, treating it with respect and knowing that's God's word that he's working through and it's not subject to our emotions. It speaks to us from God's objectivity. And bottom line, we need to be like King Josiah. He was a child king, who come across the book of the law, which is basically the Old Testament, and and what he did is he read it, and he just didn't put it back on the shelf and say, oh, that's nice. No, he put it into action. He, he applied it to himself, the city, the country. And, but where we're at, as Joseph Matera says again, our biblical illiteracy has already reached a point to which many of our brothers and sisters do not know the difference between the true move of God and an emotional tizzy. Or biblical reformation from a um, political victory. We don't know the difference because we don't know the word of God. And when it doesn't sound right, 
How, how we do if we don't immerse ourselves in the Word, if we don't really wrestle with it and study it and research it and not just use it as something that's on the shelf that can be used now and again. Jesus himself, he gives us the focus. In the first reading, you heard him say, come follow me. Now, that isn't, you know, just follow the leader. No, he's a rabbi and he's saying to these disciples, well, these people, that I want you to be my disciple. In other words, I want you to do what I do. And a disciple is so honoured to be called that they want to be exactly like their rabbi and they follow that close to imitate him, well, there's a saying, may you be caked in the dust of your rabbi. And that's the whole thing about being a disciple, focusing upon our rabbi and our rabbi, rabbi is Jesus. And, well, Second Peter chapter 3 gives us, well, this warning. It says, therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. Don't let anything else influence you and draw you away. But Peter continues, he says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. You know, in the second reading, you know, this is Jesus walking on the water and he walks up to the boat and everybody freaks out. And he said, don't worry about, uh, don't worry, guys, it's me. And Peter says, well, if, if it is you, Lord, let me come out to you. And well, Jesus says, come. So Peter steps out onto the water and he's walking on the water towards Jesus. But then he starts looking around because he starts worrying about himself. He's focusing upon himself. And what happens? He sinks. He sinks. He took his eyes off Jesus and he's relying on himself and he can't do it anymore. He can't do it anymore. So he calls out to the only one who can save. And that's the Lord of glory, our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, Lord, save me. And Really, that's our premise as well. In Acts 4.12, it says, there is no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God communicates to that to us and tells us that that's the truth. We can't just read into it emotionally and say, well, I don't like this bit and I don't like that bit, but this bit's okay. No, we've got to take the whole word of God as it is, as the beautiful gift that it is from God himself. You know, just to tie this off, I want to just read another text from Romans 12. It says, uh, Paul, inspired to write by the Holy Spirit, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. He continues, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Hear that? Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. How? Through the word of God as the spirit works through it and enables our minds to be transformed. And then, brothers and sisters, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. So the Bible is not another book. And it's certainly not a self-help book. What it is, is a book that glorifies our Saviour. And as we look to him 
and know what he has done in and through the cross, the cross. We too can be saved. We too can be saved. And if you're a believer, you know that already. So what are you doing with it? You know, don't let it go. Let it be the disciple that God is, that Jesus has called you to be. Yeah, we get a bit agitated, but this is so real and so important for all of us. So thank you for listening and God bless you all. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who died in our place so that we may be rescued into eternal life. Lord, make us aware of those things that would distort or disrupt or even destroy the word of God, your beautiful gift and message to us that points to Jesus and our hope. So thank you, Holy Spirit, that you enliven it and you awaken our souls so that we may see and know. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's confess our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered on the Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. A blessing today for All Saints Day. Go on your way rejoicing, surrounded as you are by such a great cloud of witnesses for our loving God will give courage as you face each new challenge and comfort when you pick yourself up from a fall in whatever good the spirit leads you to do proceed it with hope accompany it with prayer and follow it with thanksgiving and the blessing of God most wonderful whom the saints have trusted as father son and holy spirit throughout the ages be with you now and forevermore. And we're going to now have the blessing. And in doing so, we hold up to our loving God, Pastor Kev, who will undertake open heart surgery this week. May the Lord give him and his strength, his courage and his peace. We hold up the innocent civilians and hostages caught up in the crossfire between Israel and Hamas and Hezbollah. May God bring peace and spare suffering. And may God bring peace to Ukraine and heal our broken world. The blessing. Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, 
be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace.